I bet you're probably one of the first people we talked to that remembers Sherman McCoy. You remember him? Just barely. Just barely. He was ill when I knew him. He was not the same man. A good feeler. And uh, she didn't use very good English. She had some, the used vernacular of the natives around here, which some of her expressions were really good. She used to say, he's such a terrible farmer, it looks like he pulled a rooster through the field by his tail. <laughs> oh, she sat in her rocking chair and rocked that creaky rocking chair and crocheted and mended and did all that stuff. Always busy. And where did, you lived in town your early years. Just for, I think it was about a year and a half before we moved out here. We lived with her, so. And then when I went to high school, I stayed with her part of the time. Mm. So my grandfather was dead by then. He died before we came out here. So um, the, the ranch is doing pretty well and everybody seems comfortable. Was it, were you aware that it was more difficult in those days when you were a teenager? Oh yeah, there's no question. We had horses when I first came out here. We had horses that pulled drills and things like that. And one of the first things my dad bought was a great big Belgian stallion. We had a terrible time with that horse. <laughs> He's always getting out and running over to the neighbors, things like that. And that was the dirty 30s, right? Well, it was later than that. Okay. The dirty 30s, I wasn't here during the dirty 30s. Uh -uh. You're, I'm, I'm putting you in the wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'm not dad. quite that old. Yeah, ask your dad, please. <laughs> uh, well, tell us about Russian. Why that was before Bud was uh, your dad was involved with the ranch. Oh yeah. How did? What's the story briefly? Well, How it was during the th he was it was during the 30s and he didn't have a job and the Russian government was hiring specialists from the United States and uh, engineers and farming specialists. And we, that was the only job he could get, so we packed up and went. And he, uh, he managed a 60,000 acres. See, and I can't remember the, how many acre collective farm it was. It was a large one, wow. very large. And were there a lot of peasants there? Well, we had a little village that we lived in. And, and no, it wasn't highly populated. We were 300 miles south of Saratov, which is south of Moscow. So we were actually getting into the warmer areas of not warm enough. The winters were very long and desperate, just terrible. Were you glad to get back? I wanted an orange. I could not wait to have an orange and a banana. We never had anything like that. We ate bread. We had some, we made, what meat we had, we made soup. And I remember we split an egg three ways one Sunday. It was a big deal. It was so cold there, the egg, hens wouldn't lay. So we were really very hungry. We ate bread and soup. So there's worse weather than Western Nebraska? Oh my, oh my, their winters are dark. It's, uh, you know, Moscow's the same latitude as uh, Winnipeg, Canada. And, uh, we weren't far enough south to really get where it was warm. No ocean streams to warm anything up, you know. It's right out there in the middle of nowhere. Your dad was kind of, um, always struck me as a little bit eccentric, you know. Oh yes, he was. Um, how did he fit into the, to the ranch? Did he take to it? Oh yeah, he loved the sand hills. He loved the sand hills, and after all his education at the university was farming, and he'd grown up on a farm. It was, you know, it was easy for him to slide into it, and it was kind of backwards, you know. It isn't. He was working for the government, is uh, buying up land for dams and things like that. So, brand inspector, lots of things like that. So, it was not unusual for him to. He liked it. So it was a pretty smooth continuation from Sherman McCoy on through your dad. Was there a transition there? That well, there, see, Grandpa wasn't able to uh, tend to his business at all. Grandma was the one who was trying to take care of everything, and they had uh, renters, and some of them weren't doing a very good job, and, and uh, the ranch was in debt. 
and uh, very much in debt. And so my dad sold off some of the land so they wouldn't have that problem and uh, got everything going better. Upgraded the cattle, just lots of things I remember that he did. Because of his education, he had a good college education that way. Was that rare in those days for someone running well, a ranch out here to actually be trained in it at that level? More rare than, <laughs> than it is now. We have ranchers that have master's degrees around here. None with PhDs, but... <laughs> Do you ever feel like you're part of this big chain? I mean, you grew up here, kind of, on the ranch, mm -hmm. and then your kids grew up, and mm -hmm. now their kids look like they're growing mm -hmm. up here on mm -hmm. the ranch. I mean, mm -hmm. you just... Mm -hmm. Keeps on going, doesn't it? <laughs> Is it uh, for all? Is it is it as idyllic as one might assume? To oh, there's a lot of hard work. There's an awful lot of hard work. But uh, there are those moments when you go out in the pasture and there's you can't see any sign of civilization anywhere, you know. And it's peaceful and the grass is green. That makes it worthwhile. It really does. It's nice to ride the pastures. It really is. On a horse, especially. I haven't done that for years, but I will again. Why is the horse tired? <laughs> it's got so big. <laughs> it was working this morning? It's no fun to ride. I can't even hardly get it to walk. I see where we have it. It's very safe. You guys want to ride it? <laughs> Steven would have. He's gone. So, Tell us about the school, first off. The uh, school, the Lone Star yeah, School? People, yeah, they hear about one-room schoolhouses, but that's just, so, especially somebody your age, younger than me, now it's just out of, uh, how well, come they still had one? The one-room schoolhouse. They had more than one. They had about 26 of them in the county, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. It was a lot more fun for me than going to town school. I cried when we moved to town. Alice Hayes and Over, Annie Annie Over, those games, they were a lot of fun. I loved How it. How many students went? Twelve. There was one other person in my class. And they were all the same grade? Dale Eckert. Oh, there were two <laughs> in the same? <laughs> two of us in the same grade. So we, Dale was a guy? Dale, mm-hmm. Luckily for me, he was competitive and bright, and that probably contributed to my desire to learn. Is, is he still around? He, no, his family is. His aunt was here today, I think. And huh. I, I see him every now and then. His mom lives here and his dad. So do you think he got a decent education over there? Oh, yes. You know, what? the thing that a one-room schoolhouse did for you was it solved the problem of special education and gifted education all at the same time. Because if you didn't understand something, you'd listen to what the lower grades were learning. Or if you were bored, you'd listen to what the higher grades were learning. That was great. That was the great part of it. Now, when you went there, where were you living? At this house right behind us here. Lived at that house. Would you believe a bus came to pick us up? It's wow. you can Take see you can see the the schoolhouse from our house. But a bus came to pick us up. A bus. It was a station wagon. Sue Kinner drove it all. I'll never forget. And I was the first one dropped off, and the last one picked up. It was it was a very easy life. And at that time, yes. Bud and Mary lived in. Lived they up. lived in the big house over here. And, uh, so you went through what grade? I went through the fifth grade. We moved to town in the fifth grade. And shortly after that, the schools consolidated most of the country schools. And they. So um, yeah, I remember you in that house. That you now now you live in that same house. Now I live in the house uh, in that town into... that we moved into. That's correct. Great. So is that kind of weird? I think we all we've all shared houses in this family. I mean, you could find me in that house next year, and we've never lost sight of the fact that we can all turn any house into a home. And we've moved around. Bud and Mary lived in this one first, then they lived in that one. Now Mary's in town, and and uh, Babs and Bill have moved a couple of times, so we're comfortable with that. Yeah. Well, tell me about um, the impact of the ranch. Of course, you lived on it those first years and it's been close I mean has it now you don't work at the ranch no is it, is it like um, it seems like a part of the fabric of your life somehow you get a 
a feeling about living on a ranch changes the way you think about things. You, you like the wind and being dirty and kind of having grit in your teeth and horse hair on your pants. You, you find yourself liking those things. And Mike and I, he, he has those same feelings for different reasons, but we used to come back here for vacations because when we lived in Lincoln in the city, ironically, now we live here, we go to the city for vacations. So, even though, now he's in the banking business. Yes. And you're... I'm in the banking business, too. You're, 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 you're no longer teaching. No. Well. I've been a teacher. Yeah, I was a French teacher. Ooh. Excuse me, I'm watching a kid die on a horse. <laughs> so, well, you know a lot about the preparations for this. I mean, it's no... How long have the plans been and how much, how much work? Can you give some kind of idea well, of how much work went into this centennial? A Bud Stinger could give you a great idea of how much work has gone into the preparation of this because if he were here today, he would look at the amount of paint that has been poured into these buildings and just wonder how high the bill was. <laughs> that, that would be his concern. But it's been, it's been just beautifully uh, facelifted and fixed up for the occasion. Jeff is the one to thank for that. So He's done all the work. The beef and the corn and the, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, heavens. I think Jeff's been working on this project all year. And uh, I had a hint that he was really working very uh, diligently on the project. And I stayed away for a while because I wanted to be surprised. And I was. The first time I came out, there was bluegrass and the wagons were moved. And he's really made it look, he's brought the plate. Well, we're all proud of it. It looks beautiful. Why, um, like, why celebrate the centennial? Why um, celebrate? Nobody remembers Sherman McCoy Hartley, your mom, and yeah. your grandmother. I mean, you're, you know, that's fairly. a good question. I like being named after Susie McCoy, for what that's worth. Yeah. But, you know, there are people who say that. I say, I'm, you know, as you introduce yourself, I'm, I'm Sue Rankin and uh, Babs' daughter. And some old timers say, Oh yes. Are you named after your great grandmother? Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's that's a good feeling. And why celebrate the centennial? That brings us all together again. And many of you are still landowners. We're all a part of that feeling I talked about before. That whether we own land or not, we're yeah. It's the it's, feeling. It's our heritage. And, you know, we're all descended from those two people, and all we're all kind of. Not only the, the uh, you know, there's certain comfort, but there's a little income, but more importantly, I think some of those values that they had, uh, Bill Pribonel was talking about it, you know, the fact that you work and persevere and, and you'll survive. And, and right. It's okay in the law, you know, all that kind of Midwest. The work ethic. Yeah, that's it. I'm pounding it into my kids now. You think, is this, people would imagine it's a great place to raise kids. Do you think it is? In a I do. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to every, to everywhere you live. And the trick is to capture the advantages, which is why we have tried to be a part of the ranch. So that Sam can appreciate the greatness of a, of a huge family experience like this one is. And I think... Mary's a little young yet, but Sam's really got a, a feel for it. He loves to come out here. What you, what's happened to you all is kind of unique in our family. It seems like the rule is small families, one or two kids. <laughs> Did I get carried away, Richard? Well, not... So we were talking about um, the what kids, were we talking the about? different families. Oh, um, yes. and, and your generation, Tim. Babette's generation. What happened? She had. She was an only child. Yeah. And I don't and think she kids. liked that. Uh, she was always craving family, loved her aunts and cousins. And that was par probably part of the reason that there were such big reunions out here in the days of Babs' youth. So she had a lot of kids, the four of us, and we're pretty busy at it ourselves. And it. It's There's nice. enough of you that live here so that it's almost every weekend or so. You, it's almost like we, we, a lot of <laughs> we do. We work together. 
when we play together. And we Just, try to keep it at a, at a happy pace without uh, overwhelming each other. Work. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Does it ever seem too much work? Too much? It, it's always work to manage things well, and that goes for your family as well.